Hello, everyone, and welcome to another mystery object answer video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messi, and yesterday I showed you this instrument, which I said had to do with a field of human activity that is very important to the region of Canada where I live. Now, hopefully, most of you guess this has something to do with agriculture. Specifically, this is a TriMet Model 393 grain moisture tester. And determining the moisture content of grain is very important because if it is too high and you place your grain in a storage bin or a silo, it is going to start rotting very quickly. And for this reason, most farmers will have a portable unit like this one in order to determine the moisture content of their grain before they harvest it. While grain elevators, grain depots will have a more sophisticated version that will allow them to determine if a farmer's grain is dry enough to purchase, store, and sell. Now, if it isn't, a farmer has a number of options. They can swath their crop and leave it in windrows on the field to dry for a couple of days or weeks. They could place fans in their grain bins to remove some excess moisture, or they can take the grain to a dedicated facility to have it forced dry, though of course this costs money and will cut into the farmer's profits. Now, I don't actually have a lot of information on this particular model. Like I said, this is a Model 393 manufactured by TriMet Instruments of Winnipeg, Manitoba, my hometown, and it appears to be based off a patent filed by one John A. Stewart of Grandview, Manitoba in 1984. And this works by determining the dielectric constant of a grain sample. And to understand what this is, we need to understand how a capacitor works. Now, a capacitor at its most basic comprises two parallel conductive plates with an insulating material known as the dielectric between them. A capacitor stores energy in the form of electric charge carriers, i.e. electrons, accumulated on the surface of the plates. The ability of a capacitor to do this, its capacitance, is measured in farads, with one farad equaling one coulomb of charge per volt of potential measured between the two plates. Now, for an ideal parallel plate capacitor, capacitance is given by the following formula. C equals Ka over D, where A is the surface area of the plates, D is the distance between them, and K is the dielectric constant or relative permittivity, which is measured empirically and varies from substance to substance. For example, the dielectric constant or K value of a vacuum is defined as 1.0, air as 1.00589, and water as 87.9, though this depends on the water's temperature. And according to this formula, if the geometry of the capacitor remains constant, but the dielectric material is changed, then the capacitance of the entire capacitor will change. And this change can be measured using an outside circuit. And this is how this unit works. Now, if I unthread these little rubber feet at the bottom, I will reveal our battery compartment. So this runs off a single nine volt battery. There is also a jack or a separate wall adapter, although this particular unit is missing that component. Now, I could further disassemble this to show you the electronic components inside, but I'm not going to because it is a royal pain in the ass. This thing was not designed for easy maintenance. Rather, I can tell you that this contains something called a blocking oscillator, which generates a square wave signal with a frequency of between 11 and 12 kilohertz. And that AC voltage is applied to this test cell whose cylindrical outer wall and inner probe are electrically isolated from one another, forming a coaxial capacitor. Now, if you look at the top of the unit, we'll see we have a number of controls. We have a mode selector knob with three positions, test B, operate and calibrate. We have a calibration knob. We have an adjustment wheel with a little readout on the top. We have an operating button and we have a readout gauge. So to use this unit, you first need to calibrate it. And there are two different methods of doing this. The first is to turn the mode selector knob to test B and then obtain a standardized grain sample, which has been dried in a laboratory to a known moisture content. You then place that in the test cell, conduct the test as per usual, and then compare your results to laboratory results to determine the error of the unit. The second method is to turn the mode selector knob to calibrate, and then you turn the adjustment wheel here to the middle position, which has a little arrow marked calibrate. You then press down on the operating button and then turn the calibration knob until the needle on the readout gauge falls to zero. The second step is to obtain a grain sample, the size of which depends on the type of grain being measured. For wheat, it's 250 grams. 
And this is why the Model 393 originally came with a sensitive triple beam balance that you could carry out into the field in order to weigh your grain sample. Now, my good friend Colin, who is a farmer and helped me figure out how to use this unit, was also kind enough to provide me with a grain sample from his own field to use in this demonstration. Now, to ensure that the sample is evenly packed inside the test cell and that there are no dense areas that could affect the overall measurement, this comes with a neat little feed hopper, which has these two fall away leaves on the inside that are released by this spring loaded plunger. And so you place this on top of the test cell, you pour your grain sample inside, and then you release your grain sample by pushing down on the plunger. And this can easily be reset by simply flipping it over as so. Then to take your measurement, you push down on the operating button and then you turn the adjustment wheel until once again, the needle on the readout gauge falls to zero and your dielectric constant will show up on the gauge on the top, in this case, 45. But we're not quite done yet because to find our actual moisture content, we need to look up a table that was specifically prepared for this particular crop and which relates moisture content to our meter reading and the ambient temperature. Now, conducting this test in my basement where it's around 22 degrees, I can be fairly certain that the grain is at ambient temperature. But if you are out in the field conducting this test in the hot sun, then the grain might be significantly warmer, which is why the 393 came with a thermometer to place in the test cell to determine the grain temperature. Also, the original patent for this device included a thermistor to automatically compensate for ambient temperature, but this does not appear to have been integrated into the final design. Anyway, if we look at the intersection of our K value of 45 and our ambient temperature of 22 degrees, we find that our moisture content is 14.2%, dry enough to store and sell. So by now you're probably wondering, well, how does this actually work? What sort of circuitry does this use? to determine the capacitance and the dielectric constant of the grain. Well, this is actually a modified version of a Wheatstone bridge, which is used to determine the value of an unknown resistance. So at its most basic, a Wheatstone bridge connects a variable resistor with the unknown resistor in series, and then connects this in parallel with two other resistors of known values, with a galvanometer or ammeter for measuring current connected in between. To use the Wheatstone bridge, you adjust the variable resistor until the ammeter drops to zero, meaning that the circuit is nulled and no current is flowing between the two sides of the bridge. Then using some simple math, you can calculate the value of the unknown resistor. Now, in this version of the Wheatstone bridge, our unknown quantity is the capacitance of the test cell with the grain sample inside. Our adjustable component is a variable capacitor attached to the adjustment wheel. Our reference components are a pair of resistors of known value, and our readout is a microammeter. And so when we adjust this wheel, we are adjusting the capacitance so that this side of the Wheatstone bridge balances with our reference resistors. And if you're wondering why the circuit uses capacitors on one side and resistors on the other, that's because for alternating current, capacitors and resistors behave very similarly. They both provide AC resistance or reactance. And it's much easier to make resistors of a known precise value and which are reliable. And that, dear viewers, is how and why you perform a grain moisture test. Now, as I said, I'm rather surprised that I haven't covered agricultural topics before on this channel, given that I was born and raised on the prairies, and that when I used to be an engineer, I worked for six years for a company that made agricultural equipment. So for the sake of completeness and trying to cover the full range of human technological activity, I will try to cover more of those topics in the future. Anyway, Thank you so much for watching and a huge shout out to my friend Colin for his assistance in putting together this video. I'll see you next time in another video where we'll look at yet more fascinating instruments and other devices just like this one. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.